Hello, I'm Ian Coley, the General Manager of High Performance Computing at AWS. Quick raise of hands, how many people is this your first work trip post-COVID? All right, there's a few. How many your second trip? This is mine, I, I went to supercomputing too. How many never stopped traveling? Okay, a few of you. Um, this has been weird, uh, I'll be really honest. 24 months since I last stood on a stage here and I'll be honest, I'm a little bit of a pacer, so apologies up front, you're gonna have to follow me in the back. Uh, but it's been a strange time, uh, and I think we saw how important it is for us to engage. The, uh, us people who are so spent, steeped in technology day after day, how little we really thought we valued human in-person interaction until we couldn't have it anymore. In fact, Here's what I looked like last year when I was giving this same talk. Um, some thought I had maybe gone a little towards the hermit route. Some thought that was quite the COVID beard. Um, actually went up until I got my uh, full vaccination before I shaved everything off and went clean again. But to be honest, I think part of it was mental health. I don't know about you, but there was a strange sense of, is time passing? because it seems really slow, and I'm not really sure what's going on in the world, but I can't really tell what one day is different from the next. And so for me personally, just getting back out here and being able to talk to each of you, to be able to talk to our customers about what problems you're trying to solve, that's what gets me excited about the job. And not being able to do that, being forced to do that, mediated by a little pain of glass and lots of important technology and networking in between just isn't the same. So thank you for those of you that are here. Uh, it's really exciting to get back to face-to-face -face meetings, even if they have to be mediated by masks. So how does AWS think about HPC? We think about HPC like we think about everything. We are customer focused. And what that means is we do our working backwards process starting with the problems that you're trying to solve, and then looking at how we can build the technologies, the services that help you solve them quicker, cheaper. Those are the main things that we try to do day after day as we're talking to our customers, are what are the things where you're blocked? What are the areas where you wish you could do more, where you wish you could get more results quicker, and how would that change your innovation? One of the, the statistics that's kind of uh, shocking when you see it up there is according to a recent uh, industry study, only 20% of all high performance computing is currently done on the cloud at all. So that is still a significant portion of these highly demanding workloads that are run locked in these on-premise environments. So why is that? I see it's on us to demonstrate how we can provide that capability I think there's been throughout history of supercomputing uh, a little bit of a feeling of, okay, maybe that's good for enterprise workloads, but can the cloud really satisfy my highly demanding workloads? And I hope you'll see by the end of this presentation that we believe we can satisfy the most demanding of scientific computing, distributed machine learning of high performance computing workloads. When I talk to customers about what they're looking for out of the cloud, the first thing that comes to mind is total cost of ownership or savings. I used to spend X amount of dollars on-prem, or I currently do. Now, how can I spend less and run those same workloads on AWS? But one of the things that I think really gets undersold is what are the additional value that I get from being able to operate in an elastic environment? What are the things that I can do just by being able to turn the crank on my ideation that many more times a day by being able to elastically burst when I want to and shutting it down to zero when I don't need that anymore? What is the additional value that I can capture in that, in, in that workflow? And so that's why the TCO is important, obviously, but I think it's the TCO plus, and that's where we really need to focus on what is the, and the entire benefit of migrating your workflows to a fully elastic environment like we offer on AWS. 
So what do I mean about that elasticity? Traditionally, when we're working in high performance computing, we have this concept of bin packing the box. I mean, many of us that have spent a while in HPC take pride, personal pride in what is your percent utilization of your system. And it doesn't matter if maybe what you're doing isn't really the most beneficial to your business or the beneficial to your scientific endeavor, but boy, you've got those CPUs running 99%, so good on you. That, why is that? Because we see that we've got this massive capital upfront investment and the people on the uh, other side of the ledger there are saying, how are you using that? And what's the one mechanism that we tend to look at? Well, are we efficiently using the resources that we spent or are we not? We're not actually looking what science, what engineering is coming out the other end. And so what happens is you'll see we put lots of important jobs in there and maybe we throw some not so important or we're not really sure what, but we just kind of give out time here and there to make sure that we pack that box as tightly as possible. Now what the elasticity of AWS allows you to do, as you see the other graphic, is instead if we need a lot of resources for very important workloads, then let's spin up a lot of resources. If we have a, a period in our workflow where we don't need as many resources, then let's shut them all down because we're only paying for what we use. We've taken that concept of the box and blown it open. And now we're focusing the computing, the storage, the resources on solving the problems we need to at the particular time that we want to solve them. And that's why HPC is about making our customers more successful. It's about making them more productive. It's about not making them wait in a queue because as you saw on that last slide where we've got that box, the problem is that you're either under-provisioned or over-provisioned at any time. And what do I mean by that? Is that you're either got empty cores and so somebody's saying, hey, you've got to throw some, some jobs in there to keep your uptime up so you can look good or more likely, you've got more work to do than you can do because there are jobs sitting in queues that are backed up, waiting for their time to come up. I spoke to scientists at uh, NREL. I'm, I'm living in Golden, Colorado, where NREL is right up the hill from us. And they said, I sometimes have to wait months to get the time that I need to do the research that I need to compute just because it's a resource allocation time. My time doesn't come up until that point. Now, again, you have to argue about, okay, then you have to get in priority discussions about why didn't you get that time sooner? What if you could get that tomorrow? But let's think about that culture of innovation and what that says to that person is, you know, that work that you're doing, just keep working on something else for a while and when we get you the resources, we'll get around to it. As opposed to saying, you know what, whether you, get, you spend those, let's just make up a number, 100 CPUs today, or whether you spend that in a month or in three months, it's gonna cost the same to us, so why don't we give that to you now and then see how you can ideate upon that with the learnings that you've got from being able to perform that work. And here's where we see a couple of our customers, Joby Aviation, that's doing some significant improvements to uh, air travel, and they're able to do that based upon the complex scaling out that they're able to perform on ABOS as opposed to their on-premise uh, resources. Fred Hutch looking at cancer and looking at how can they combat cancer specifically through genomic sequencing. And they're able to scale out far significantly and to perform workloads in days or hours that would have taken them weeks or months or in some cases even years on-premise. On so when we say HPC on AWS, that's, you, know, you can kind of get a lot of things in your head and what does that really mean for a high performance computing architecture? But it's kind of the standard of what you would expect out of any architecture. We go all the way from the batch processing, the scheduling, from all to the remote visualization. And so you've got companies that are using nice DCV, a remote visualization protocol, to visualize genomic folding sequencing while it's performed on an EC2 instance and they're on a laptop anywhere in the world. We've got companies like, uh, mm. as I said, it's been 24 months since I did this. A 
as I said, with any sort of HPC architecture, you've got to have key components to the architecture. You've got to have your compute, you have to have your networking, you have to have your storage. You have to have something to manifest or create or instantiate the uh, orchestration layer. And you have to have a, a scheduler. And then if you desire a remote visualization to push those results out to somewhere along the way. And that's where you'll see HPC on AWS is much like HPC anywhere in that we have our EC2 instances providing that compute. We've got our elastic fabric adapter providing that low latency, high performance network. And you've got AWS parallel cluster and engine frame providing management. Our managed luster offering in Amazon FSx for luster. AWS batch is our native batch scheduler. And then again, on top of that all, nice DCV providing their remote visualization. One of the things we pride ourselves on AWS is choice. We want to give you, the customers, the choice. And that choice isn't just in the number of instances. It's in the type of instances. It's in the huge families of instances. You can get all the way from a low gigahertz clock CPU to a high gigahertz clock CPU, if that's what your workloads demand. You can get a low memory bandwidth instance, or you can get a high memory bandwidth instance, depending upon your workload. But customers don't just look to us for options around what the physical hardware that they're running on comes from. They want options around purchasing. And so that's where you get the flexibility of on-demand, reserved instances, or spot instances, if your workloads can handle that interruption that comes with a spot instance. And so we provide that flexibility to customers so that they can choose the purchase option that works best for them and their workloads. Again, back to choices. One of the, one of the things we really pride ourselves is that we will provide you the broadest range of CPUs of any vendor in the cloud. So you've got our longtime commitment with Intel, which I'll go into later about some of the history there. AMD instances, whether that be Naples, Rome, or Milan. And our own AWS Graviton 2. And you'll see us continuing to innovate as we work with each of those chip providers. One of the ones we introduced last year that I want to continue to talk about is our C6GN. Again, so that's our sixth generation compute optimized instance with enhanced networking. Hence the, the C6G for Graviton, N for enhanced networking. With a 100 gigabits network and with that ARM architecture, you can see the price performance benefits that many of our customers are getting. Let me just show you one of our workloads here. This is Wharf, a common weather forecasting tool. And you can see where we've got the lines of C6G versus C6GN with that enhanced networking versus our standard Intel C5N networking. And so you can see that the savings is tremendous when you get that, those codes that can be performed on ARM versus standard x86. But it's not just CPUs. We also want to offer our customers a broad selection of accelerators, be that GPU or FPGA, or our own custom inference, the inferentia. So you can see that we've got a variety of Xilinx FPGAs, NVIDIA GPUs, or we're going to continue, and you'll hear more about that, to re reiterate and create new AWS chips. One of the ones that we released earlier that has been extremely popular with distributed machine learning and high performance computing customers are our P4D instances. These are real beasts. These have eight A100 NVIDIA GPUs in a single P4D instance. And then they're in these ultra clusters where you can get up to 4,000 GPUs. And they're interconnected again with that EFA fabric allowing you to have that high throughput, low latency interconnect. With Nickel and uh, GPU Direct really speeding up that transfer of data from GPU to GPU, so you can complete those complex, highly data intensive machine learning applications. But again, it's not just enough about what we've done in the past 
you, our customers, continue to ask, how are you going to continue to innovate going forward? And so our promise to you has always been that we will continue to work with our variety of chip suppliers, both CPU and GPU, and we will continue to bring you new instance types to find the ones that work best in a price performance for your workloads. Our Intel collaboration is now incredibly going on 15 years since we lost or, uh, launched our first instance with Intel. And we're going to continue to bring you the latest and greatest Intel chips on EC2 instances. And one of the, the family of ones that we launched just recently this fall were the sixth generation C, M, and R series. Those are the C6i, M6i, and R6i. Now, one of the things we changed up a little bit as we brought you a variety of suppliers is that you may have noticed in the past we just had C5 or C4. And now we have an I on the end or an A on the end or a G on the end to reflect that diversity of suppliers. And all of that is to allow that flexibility for you, the customer, to find the right one that is sufficient for your workloads at the price performance that's important for you. I want to dig a little bit more into the C6i instance because they're so popular with a lot of our uh, HPC customers. These are based on the new Ice Lake instance uh, CPU processor from Intel. We are the first cloud to have them generally available. And one of the significant things is that we beefed up both the EBS bandwidth and the network throughput over the, the previous C5 generation. So you can see you've got double the bandwidth to both EBS and to the network. Hello? Let me show you a little bit of data that we came up with for our uh, benchmarking. And how do, these, how do these new C6i instances perform compared to previous C5n. So you can see this is performing the Siemens uh, Star Center, Sim Center Star CCM Plus benchmark. So you can see not only were they faster, but they were cheaper. And so we're really excited to see what our customers can do running their demanding HPC workloads on the C6i instance. But again, it's not just compute where we're innovating. Customers are asking us to do more for accelerated instances as well. And that's why you've seen the new G5 instance come out. Based upon the NVIDIA A10G GPU, 24 gigs of memory. And you can see the advancements in machine learning performance that customers are achieving with these G5 instances. It's improved their time to performance, and reduce their costs. Right now, I'm really excited to talk about something that we uh, discussed first a couple weeks ago at Supercomputing, but is our soon-to-be-released HPC 6A instance. This is our first of a new instance family. You can see in the past, we've had C for Compute Optimized, We've had P for accelerated. And now we're introducing this new family, HPC6. And again, as the A on the end may give you a hint, these are AMD-based instances. These are based on the AMD Milan processor. And these are, again, really a beast of a machine with those 96 cores in it, the memory bandwidth that you expect from your HPC workloads, and at a 3.6 gigahertz, we believe extremely performant. And of course, these will come with elastic fabric adapter and our 100 gig networking. So what have our customers been able to do with them already? Well, here we see DTN, who are extremely active in weather forecasting and numerical weather modeling. Again, some of the most demanding numerically precise workloads. And they were so happy with the performance of, and the price performance of HPC 6A 
that they plan to use them as their go-to instance for HPC workloads in the future. So I've talked about compute. Now let's get to the network. Elastic fabric adapter. Again, many times when I speak to um, people in also like traditional scientific computing, like, wait, where's your InfiniBand? You gotta have some, so, some sort of a low latency interconnect. And as I go into elastic fabric adapter, I hope you'll give it a chance to see a little bit why we think it's so powerful and why we've chosen to build something that is an interconnect that's more like AWS, that scales like us. And what it's based upon is this scalable, reliable datagram. And if you look at the animation there on the left, what's unique about SRD is that whereas InfiniBand sees the multiplicity of paths from point to point and says, oh my gosh, I gotta pick the best one and just jam as many packets as I can uh, across it, and then if anything drops out, okay, I'm gonna have to get a retransmit. SRD says, cool, there's a whole bunch of different paths. Spray the packets everywhere. They'll figure it out, they'll get there eventually. And then it, we allow ourselves at higher levels within the network stack to then reassemble those. And if they're required to be processed in order, then we handle it in that end. And what we find is that when we have occasional dropouts, which any network is gonna have, SRD is so much more performant than traditional TCP. And our customers see their applications performing at levels that when they run synthetic benchmarks may not give them the initial indication that they would be. One of our customers that's really taking full advantage of this EC2 and EFA as flying whales, they're really bringing back the airship and they're doing complex computational fluid dynamics using both parallel cluster, EC2 networking, and EFA. So again, we've gone into the compute, the networking, now into the orchestration layer. How do we do that? One of our key components of or orchestration is AWS Parallel Cluster, an open source project that we initially began jointly with Intel. We turned into a fully supported AWS service a couple years ago. And we've continued to innovate. And one of the most significant innovations I wanna talk about is our 3.0 release. And that's where we really kind of moved away from where it had been a lot of scripting uh, early on and was pretty uh, complex for new users to fill out to try to bring it more into infrastructure as code or a modern API infrastructure as we would see in traditional enterprise workloads. And so with Parallel Cluster 3.0 now, you've got that new Parallel Cluster API that you can make calls to that will help instantiate your cluster that gives you more of that API look and feel. And it's allowing us to, in, to iterate and to provide more features going forward and to accelerate the development of Parallel Cluster uh, at a much quicker pace than we could in the past. Another one of our significant uh, developments this year is Nice Engine Frame with AWS HPC Connector. Some of you may be familiar with Nice Engine Frame as an on-premises portal. It was, it's very popular with customers to use as a workflow management and to have job flows uh, scheduled through it to manage their on-premises resources. And customers were asking us, okay, but how do I integrate that into my AWS workflow. I don't wanna have like one workflow for my on-premises system and a separate workflow for my AWS infrastructure. How can I make sure that my portal can actually instantiate clusters on AWS via AWS Parallel Cluster? And that's why we created this AWS HPC connector, which is coming soon. There you can see it manages, uh, Nice Engine Frame manages the, the so important data file transfer for you. So you can tag, okay, here's a job that's associated with a certain data set. And do I, if I wanna then execute it 
on AWS, I need to make sure that that data is present because it won't do you any good to spin up that cluster and migrate that workflow if you don't have the data that runs along with it. Now onto the storage. One of the most uh, impressive performance improvements that I've seen is from customers who've taken away, found a way to leverage Amazon FSx for Lustre in their high performance computing workloads. Because one of the, the interesting parts about EFA is that since we can have it on our newer instances, we have it in our Lustre file system, that your I.O. speeds are tremendous and you remove a lot of those bottlenecks. And what's so interesting about the way that we've done this managed Lustre file system is this isn't like your traditional on-prem where, okay, you'd stand up a petabyte of, of scratch uh, Lustre file system and it's just there forever and you parcel it out to certain uh, user groups and they clean it up maybe or not uh, every once in a while. But with the way that we do the elasticity of AWS, it's not just the compute instances that can flex up and down, but it's your POSIX compliant file storage. So here what you can do is what we have customers do is stand up this file system when they need to do a run. They hydrate the data that they've kept off in, in a lower cost uh, S3 object storage or on-prem. They put it up in the file system. They do the computations that they want to perform. And then once their job's complete, not only do they shut down the compute, but they save the, the results off and shut down the whole storage. You may have some customers that to improve the speed of elasticity will leave a little bit up just to make sure. Um, but uh, a large number of our customers completely shut down their storage system and their compute system. So they're not paying for anything when they're not actively using those resources. The next onto the scheduler. AWS Batch is our container native job scheduler. And one of the significant things that we worked on this year for you is adding fair share scheduling. For those of you that are um, not familiar with job scheduling, you can have a thing called front of line blocking. And what that means is basically I'm a user that's got priority and I've got a bunch of really long running jobs and so I can just hog the queue. And even though maybe you just have this one little job that is really important to you and would really help you out to get that executed, if you're doing a true uh, first in first out FIFO workflow, I'm stuck. I've got to wait until all of yours complete. So now by adding fair share scheduling, what it makes sure is that, okay, I'll give some of the processing to these large jobs, but I'll keep a little bit aside and I'll make sure that some of those smaller jobs keep getting through so they don't get so blocked on waiting for resources. They're being consumed by those extremely long running jobs. And so we're really excited to see how our customers can take advantage of that fair share scheduling. And again, on top of it all, at the end of the day, and one of the things that we really found out was so important during this pandemic was the fact that being resident, physically resident with where your compute is happening is often not only undesirable, but it's impossible. In many cases, there were millions of us who could not go into where our workstations were, could not go into our data centers where our computations were occurring. And so we leverage remote visualization, being able to remotely display the computations that are being performed on those systems back to wherever we are. Be that a tablet, be that a laptop, be that another computer at home, and still be able to get our work done. And that's the power of Nice DCV, is that remote visualization of being able to even control those resources remotely, being able to interact with those pixels and push those across the network at varying network latencies. One of our customers that's really been taking advantage of that uh, has, has been uh, Volkswagen. And 
as you can see, they have a thousand automotive engineers working in CAE. Could not be resident with their workstations. What do they do, shut everything down? No, by being able to remote in and leverage this remote visualization, they are able to continue to keep their cars safe and on the road. What I hope you see during this is that we've got such a variety of instances, a variety of services, that regardless of the workflow, you can do the most demanding reservoir simulation, weather forecasting, or computational fluid dynamics. All of it is possible on AWS. And right now, I'd like to turn it over virtually to a video of our participant from ARM, who's an active customer in high-performance computing. Philippe Moyer, Vice President Design Automation, Physical Design Group at ARM. Hi everyone, I'm Philippe Moyer, VP of Design Automation at ARM Physical Design Group. I'm going to briefly talk about Physical Design Group activities. Physical Design Group PDG is developing the foundation IP, which are the building blocks our partners are using to build their SOC, their chip, for a given foundry and technology node. We are developing those foundation IP for a large range of technology going from 180 nanometer down to the 3 nanometer most advanced technology known today. Through our implementation knowledge, we provide implementation solution to our partner so they can build the best ARM core, getting the best PPA power performance area in a very timely manner. PDG, Physical Design Group, was the pioneer within ARM to go on the cloud. We started our production more than three years back now. And the main reason we went to the cloud are very simple. The first one is because of the difficulty we have to accurately predict the CPU need after one to two quarters. The second reason is linked with our design cycle. We have phases which require a huge amount of CPU and we have other phases which barely need any. The, the elasticity the cloud is providing allow us to, start to address this large variation in terms of CPU need. The third reason is linked with the schedule and time to market. We have to support more and more capabilities and features in our product, which drastically increase the amount of CPU we need, and this for a fixed time to market for the same time. The capacity on the cloud allows us to scale and meet this very aggressive time frame. Finally, but not least, going to the cloud allows us to enable our ARM on ARM strategy. What we call ARM on ARM is developing our ARM IP or using ARM-based CPU like the Graviton 2 family AWS is providing. I'm gonna now talk about the different type of workload we have to support on the cloud. The first one on the top left corner is what we called background batch workload or heavy batch type of workload. This is hundreds of thousands to a million of jobs we have to run as quickly as possible. Going to the cloud, we get a drastic improvement in turnaround time moving from months on premise to weeks on the cloud. For this workload, we are using an hybrid approach, which means the project database remain on premise. The engineers submit the job on premise, they run on the cloud. When completed, we move back the data on premise. The second type of workload is what we call the compound workload. This is linked with the EDA tool, electronic design automation tool capability to dispatch themselves their own job. For this, we need to be sure they access a cluster on the cloud which is compatible with their requirement. Finally, the last workload is interactive and foreground workload. For this workload, 
is used by engineering during the design phases. The access the cloud through a graphical or command line interface to interact with the EDA tools. For this workload, the project database remain on the cloud. We are no more in an hybrid mode. I just talked about the different type of workload we have to support on the cloud. Each of them have different characteristics, different specification, which drive slightly different implementation on the cloud. If we look on the top right corner here, for the batch type of workload, I, as I said, 100,000 of jobs we have to run as quickly as possible. The objective is to scale and to have an efficient usage of the core available in the EC2 instances. For this, we rely on AWS, AWS Batch as the orchestration for our job. AWS Batch provide all the scalability and performance we need. The second type of workload, interactive and foreground workload. We, we use the P cluster parallel cluster to create on the cloud a cluster which look and feel similar to what we have on premise. The engineer connect to this environment through nice DCV. Because for this interactive workload, all the database remain on, on the cloud, we need to be sure we use a storage infrastructure which meet all the EDA tool performance requirement at a very competitive cost. We use for that FSX for Luxter, which gives us the performance we need, which are totally compatible with the EDA tool need at a very aggressive price. Finally, for the compound workload, we still use the P cluster in order to meet all the EDA tools requirement to be able to dispatch their own job on the cloud. In conclusion, even if we have different type of workload to support on the cloud, having different type of requirement, AWS provide all the services, all the API to move this workload on the cloud in a timely and secure manner. I'm gonna now switch gear and talk about running the EDA tools on our base CPU from the Graviton2 family. More than four years ago, we started to work with the EDA ecosystem to have their tool suite ported on our architecture. They have done an amazing job. Today, all the job physical design group, all the tools physical design group are running on the cloud, are supported on our architecture and are production ready. More than 80% of the job PDG physical design group run on AWS are using Graviton2 instances. On this slide, I'm showing for few EDA tools the performance comparison between the M6G, which is a Graviton2 instance, ARM-based Graviton2 instance, versus the x86 equivalent. Along with the performance comparison, you can see the cost benefits you can get using the Graviton2. Across the board, you, you, we get better performance and better cost using the Graviton2 family instances. In addition to the performance, the cost reduction, in terms of sustainability, using the Graviton2 family allow us to reduce the carbon footprint of the CPU cycle we run on the cloud. To summarize, if it's for performance or for cost reduction or sustainability and carbon footprint reduction, go and use the Graviton2 family on AWS. On this, I'm gonna hand over to Ian. Thank you very much. Thanks, Philippe. But it's not just EDA customers like ARM who are taking advantage of the flexibility and variability that we supply at AWS. We have customers across workloads. AstraZeneca, Aurora, Store Energy, DTN I discussed earlier. Formula One, revising their rules to try to make the races more performant. 
How do they do that? By running computational fluid dynamics and workflows on AWS. But it's not just enough to have variety. A little bit of instance here, a little bit of instance there. One of the important things about high performance computing is scale. Right? It's great if you can have one or two of an instance, but for many of these complex workloads, you need hundreds of thousands or millions of cores. And so that's why we're extremely excited about the work that we were able to do with a Cambridge-based university and our partner Intel around virtual flow. Virtual flow was able to analyze billions of possible proteins to look for areas of interest for treating cancer. And how do they do that? By scaling up to the largest ever run on 2.2 million vCPUs. And then we have Woodside Energy running their reservoir simulations and seismic processing. And in this seismic processing, they needed over a million vCPUs. And then we have what I'll call a top 500 run that was short-lived. Traditional HPC systems, when you'd go, you'd build up a system on-premises, and you'd run various benchmarks on it, and you'd see where did it come in at, and then you'd submit those results to a list called the top 500, and that was the, you know, the rating of that system at that time. Now, the Cart Labs a customer of ours said we'd like to do a top 500 run, and when they actually ran it uh, initially uh, in the in the spring, it was uh, in the top 40 since different systems have come in ahead of time. But even though still. Here we are in this November latest version of the top 500. It was ranked in the top 50. And this is a system that, that was instantiated temporarily to run some workloads and to demonstrate the capability they could perform, and then reallocated. And that's what we want our customers to do. We don't want them to feel like you're locked into a specific form or structure. You're able to take the work that you need to get done, apply the compute resources against it, and then shut it down, only paying for what you use. And that innovation has been recognized by our customers throughout the HPC industry. At the supercomputing conference in St. Louis two weeks ago, we are awarded four HPC Wire Reader's Choice Awards. Now, what I think is so significant about this is these are the readers here who are saying, we identify you, AWS, as innovators in this area. And the one I'm, I'm most proud of is this best HPC cloud platform, which we've now run, which we've now won for four years in a row. And so the most demanding customers who are running complex scientific computing workloads, extreme distributed machine learning workflows, are relying upon AWS to run high performance computing. So what I'd ask each one of you is to think about what are the workflows in your system? Where, how could you unblock innovation from your research scientist? How could your engineers ideate more quickly what could you do to wh whether it be finding the next potential solution to carbon sequestration or whether it be some way to store high energy output of renewable energy? How could we change the dynamic if we could innovate even faster? So how could you accelerate your innovation on AWS? Thank you.